Hello, Pelicans and friends of UWI. Welcome to Pelican Talks, a Google Hangout where we promote interactive and positive discussion about a variety of topics and engage our UWI alumni across the Caribbean and the world. It's my pleasure to have as our special guest on Pelican Talks today, Her Excellency Ambassador Dr. June Sumer, a distinguished UWI alumna. Welcome, welcome, welcome. <laughs> Thank you very much. To all our Pelican Talks viewers, Her Excellency Dr. June Sumer is a two-time graduate of the UWI, receiving her Bachelor of Arts Honors degree in 1987, and then her PhD in History from the UWI in 1994. She was the first female to graduate with a doctorate in History from the UWI Cave Hill campus. She's also the Secretary General of the Association of Caribbean States, ACS, and is again the first woman appointed to this position. Yet again, another first. She is a historian and has worked in the diplomatic, financial, and education sectors, regionally and internationally. And we are truly delighted that you're here sharing with us today, Your Excellency. Thank you again for coming. Thank you for inviting me. <laughs> you are indeed a fascinating person. So let's begin with your Caribbean heritage. Where were you born? Are you from a large family? How do they view your success, etc.? Well, thank you very much for that introduction. My family is extensive. <laughs> I have four brothers and four sisters. I am the seventh of nine children. Okay. <laughs> I have two brothers and sisters, and they have my main support system. They are a tremendous family. My Caribbean connection. I am born in St. Lucia, yes, but I have lived in Barbados, in Trinidad, in St. Kitts and Nevis. With regard to my family, I have one sister married to a Jamaican, one married to a Barbadian, one married to a, a Puerto Rican UV, um, USB Islander. I have a nephew married to a Belizean, one married to a Guyanese Bajan, one with a Bajan, one married to a St. Lucian, one married to a Haitian. My nieces and nephews are born throughout the region. I am truly a Caribbean person. CARICOM resides in my house. <laughs> and we have a family reunion, which usually involves about 70 people every three years. Mm -hmm. Then we have a huge CARICOM bash. So Absolutely. That's it's amazing. Family. <laughs> That's absolutely amazing. You really have to chart the history of everybody. <laughs> yes. And I'm sure they're very proud of you. Well, they would have been proud of me no matter what I had done. That's wonderful. They're very supportive and we have the family that will encourage and help you financially and otherwise. I mean, the emotional support is tremendous also in my family. My big brothers are, have always been my father figures. And my younger brother, who thinks that he is my big brother, behaves that way also. <laughs> okay. That's very interesting. I know you have a brother who shares your diplomatic, I believe, success. Can you share his story as well a little bit with us? Yes. My brother, uh, Rodinal Suma, is the CEO of the CARICOM Development Fund. It's the first time that a brother and sister are heading regional organizations. So I am extremely proud of my little brother. He's a wonderful economist and a great person all around. So we, are, we have a family that um, came from a, a very underprivileged background. My mother, with nine children, my mother was a single parent. And so her emphasis was always on education and doing better. She never saw um, being poor, although I would have to say that most people in my neighborhood were poor. But um, she didn't see poverty as a distraction. So she encouraged schools, schooling, um, proper dress, etiquette, etc. So she raised us properly. Wonderful. That's a true Car in true Caribbean style, I should say. I'm telling you, she was a true Caribbean mother. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Are any of your brothers and sisters also UWI graduates? Yes, my brother Roddy is also a UWI graduate. 
and my nieces and nephews. I have a, a niece who lives in Jamaica, um, who is a, a medical doctor, UWI graduate. So Wonderful. we have UWI graduates throughout. Amazing connections. And you studied at the UWI in Cave Hill only, or? In Cave Hill, but I did get the opportunity to, um, when I was doing postgraduate work, to work at the time at ISA in Trinidad and ISA in Jamaica. So I did a, a stint in Jamaica briefly. It was part of, because I wrote on regional integration, I actually wrote on um, a regional public service. And I, so I looked at the, um, the federal system and the civil service there. And so I had to travel throughout the region conducting interviews with former civil servants. Most of the politicians were gone at that time, but I did manage a lot of, of the, um, the public servants. Okay. <laughs> All right. Very good. So what are the best UA memories that you have? For me, my best UA memory is not about schooling. It's really about the social activities. I found UWE to be a very warm place where people from all of the islands could meet at that common ground. And uh, I remember my very first day on campus when I finished registration, that I went down to the um, common room, the students' common room. And uh, I'm a very good domino player. <laughs> and so I walked up to a table and I said, how do I get a game? And the young man who was standing waiting for a game also said, just say you're fielding. And so I said, I'm fielding. So all of the men looked up and watched this woman and wondered, you know, but I went, I played, and great respect. My, <laughs> partner, my, my domino partner became um, um, Clem Bird from Antigua and Barbuda, and there was a tournament which we won. So I have the mark also of being a very good domino player. Excellent. So, <laughs> and then my brother was very much into sports. He was the triple jump and the long jump champion on campus, and actually won also at inter-campus games. So we, um, we did our part quite apart from excelling academically at UWE. Absolutely. I think the social aspect of a university is very, very, very important. And I'm so happy that the Caribbean connection, again, you've shown how important that is. So are you still in touch with friend? I can go to any Caribbean island and meet a UWE friend. Oh, wonderful. Wonderful. I think we need to try and see if we can have that happen more nowadays. There are just so many students, though. It's not... Not quite as possible, but I think the, the Caribbean mixing is what keeps us centered. So let's I hope that we can do that. And you, know, you were also a UWI lecturer. Um, what did you lecture in? How was that experience? I lectured um, a, a very open course history program, the general history program that we had at UWI at the time, and uh, where we looked at the, the Caribbean from the beginning to the end. So we, I had students from all of the faculties and I could stand up in the law lecture theater at the time with 300 students and stand at the bottom and they would hear me at the top. <laughs> so I really enjoy that. I see lecturing as a time to really perform mm -hmm. and to really engage your students. I had a wonderful experience for two years lecturing at UWE. And um, I meet students even today who tell me that they, I had an impact on them because I enjoy teaching history. Yes, I can tell just by you, you talking about it now. Hopefully I'll get a, the, uh, the opportunity to invite you to come and talk about history at UWE one day and of about course. experiences. Wonderful. Do you have any particularly memorable moments as a lecturer rather than a student? That... Well, for me, I... As a lecturer, the, the most important thing was the support because I was, at the time, the only female lecturing in the department. And so the support of my male colleagues was really important to me. At the time, the current vice chancellor was my head of department, and I got a lot of support, a lot of um, great advice. They helped to nurture me. And so it is not just my mixing with my students that was important, but with my colleagues and the kind of family that we had in that department at the time. Oh, I, so, her, so Hillary was your head of department, our, our current yes. chancellor. She was my, one of my history lecturers. Wonderful. Um, 
I have a very interesting story with him because he walked into the class the first day and he said, nobody has ever received an A in this course and nobody ever will. And I looked at him, you know, stunned. I thought to myself, this man obviously does not know me. <laughs> <laughs> and then I got two A's in my first two essays. And so he, he came in the class after he had finished reading and he said, I would like to see June Suma in my office, please. <laughs> to challenge him that's wonderful we, we we need to he needs to be challenged we all need to be challenged so you were his challenge at the time yes <laughs> okay i know you'll be coming to jamaica to take part in the uwi 70th anniversary celebration in july and in fact you are going to be celebrated as you will be presented with the uwi alumni association pelican award on july 25th i should just let our viewers know that the special Pelican Awards will take place on the evening of July 25th at the Mona Lodge and seven alumni selected by peers and the chancellor, who's the head of the Alumni Association. They will be, uh, all of the seven will represent each decade from 1948 to 2018. And you, Your Excellency, you will be honored for your achievements and also represent the decade 1989 to 1998 as you received your doctorate in 1994. I'd just like to mention too that the UWI Alumni Association St. Lucia chapter nominated you and the president, Lydia Daria, and her team are tuning in today. I know they're very proud and happy that their nomination was one of the ones selected. So Lydia and team, uh, I just mentioned Marcia Dollar Lashley, Sylvia Jeffrey, Denise, Denise Gustav, uh, Gorman Duncan, Deanna Josephs, and Nerian Alexander. I know you're all celebrating um, as you have your nominee, now confirmed awardee, uh, with, with us today on the program. So congratulations in advance. I'm sure many St. Lucians will be very pleased to know this and people generally across the Caribbean. Oh, and indeed they are because I'm actually just seeing now a message of congratulations officially from the UWI Alumni Center. Uh, Association St. Lucia chapter from the president Lydia Daria coming in to you. <laughs> well, thank you very much. I didn't know that. I didn't know the process. <laughs> I only heard about it now from you. So thank you very much to the chapter. Yes, we are very pleased indeed too here. Uh, and now speaking of St. Lucia, a graduate from the Open Campus Dominica is asking whether you knew Nobel laureate Derek Walcott and to share your thoughts about his work and influence. Thank you very much for the question. I worked on the Nobel Laureates Committee in St. Lucia for about eight years together with the then Governor General, Dave Pullet Louise. And so I met Derek Walcott on many occasions. For me, the influence was twofold. First, as a St. Lucian, coming from such a small country and producing two Nobel Laureates told me that it, I was, there was not a limit set on me. I could be anything that I wanted to be. And secondly, I really enjoyed his poetry with regard to home and the sea. For me, home is in your heart and you must celebrate home all of the time. The Caribbean Sea has become even more relevant because in, that, in, in some of his poems, he talks about the limitlessness of what we have. And coming to the ACS now, I can identify with that. And so for me, the Caribbean Sea and his poems on the Caribbean Sea are part of my mantra now at the ACS. And so I, um, I'm really proud to be a St. Lucian for, for these reasons, but for much more than that. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, your, your PhD thesis. Now we'll move um, to talk a little bit about that from Yui uh, as you, it was entitled, An Assessment of the Factors Affecting the Structure and Functioning of the British West Indies Federal Civil Service, 1947 to 1952, which you mentioned a little bit before. And this highlighted, I believe, your passion for regional integration. And this has been maintained throughout your entire career. So speak to us a little bit about your regionalist viewpoints and why you think the Caribbean should strengthen, strengthen this union. Let me take it from the perspective of cricket. Okay. <laughs> I'm a great cricket fan and I have written on cricket um, from the regional perspective. Yes. And so I think that 
there is nowhere in the world where you can find so much excellence amongst a small group of people. And for me, what is very important is that we support each other in that pursuit of excellence. It is not about what we don't have. I think regional integration tells us what we have and the limitlessness of what we have. I'm starting from cricket because it is a game that has had its ups and downs, just like the regional integration movement. But you cannot stop supporting West Indies cricket. Who else is going to support young black men? Sorry to put it like this, but that is what it is. Anywhere else in the world, not Australia, not England, not the United States, we have to support each other for us to produce that excellence. And so for me, the regional integration movement is like that. We have to continue to support each other. There is not another country in the world that will support us the way we can support each other. So regional integration helps us to see ourselves as one set of people. We are not different. Our experiences are the same historically. Our experiences are the same now, whether we want to admit it or not, no matter how we align ourselves. And our experiences will be the same in the future. For me, regional integration is not about what one country can get over another country. We, we already don't have enough for everybody, but pulling of resources can help. A long time ago, we had something in St. Lucia called Kudme. Kudme was where, and I'm sure that you have it in Jamaica in some form or the other, where communities would get together, let's say, on a Saturday and would help you to build your house. They would help you to build the, your house, even if you did not have one, they didn't have one themselves. And then, and then you would cook and so on for the people who were helping you to build your house and put it together. And next weekend, we would build a house for somebody else. Nobody, no, it didn't matter that somebody did not have a house at the time. We knew and we trusted that we would help each other. And that is what regional integration means to me. It's in the heart of the people. And I think that if we look at my family alone, where you see regional integration thriving, you will understand that regional integration is not about political solutions only. Regional integration is about the people and it's time that we start involving the people more. Yes, but very profound and very true. I think, it, as you say, it does reside with the people and the pooling of resources and self-reliance and, and, and focusing on the Caribbean as one. Um, I hope many people heard your message this morning and will take it to heart. I know I certainly believe that and um, will help spread, spread the word. <laughs> um, a graduate of our Cave Hill campus in Barbados wants to know if you face challenges professionally because of your gender. Oh, yes, a lot of challenges. I have to tell you that um, at every step, even as a postgraduate student, I remember going to um, my first Caribbean Studies conference with my, with my then supervisor, um, Dr. Neville Duncan, who is a Jamaican. And um, we walked into the conference and somebody said to me, oh, we have many activities for the wives. It's <laughs> to present. And I got that on more than one occasion going to conferences. And then I, when I became ambassador, well, even before I became ambassador, when I worked at the central bank, no matter how my secretary sent out a, a letter from me, the response would always be, dear Mr. Suma. And then <laughs> um, when I became ambassador, it was, it was another you know, dilemma. I would always find myself the only female in the room. Oh my goodness. And if I didn't find myself the only female in the room, um, sometimes I would be the only black female in the room. Mm. And so it has been a challenge. Um, many people, you walk into the room and they, they see you first before they hear what you say. And, and, and your physical appearance as a woman is always a distraction until you start to, to speak. And let me give you the example of cricket. I, want to, I went to cricket one day with a friend mm -hmm. and um, I was speaking to him about what was happening in the game. 
and somebody behind, a man behind us said, oh, she really knows what she's talking about. It is as if women are supposed to be vacant in, in, in these areas. And, and so it has, been, it has not been easy. I think that for me, coming strategically within that decade, I have to carry the burden and, and, and the hopes of women. Burden of the past because many women did not get that opportunity. And sometimes it is it's even a little difficult for me to say that I was, I'm, I'm the first female secretary general, for example. Many more women um, could have been secretary general because we have competent women. And then I have to, to always be sure that I do my best and do it even better because I am, I'm, I'm paving the way for more women, more black women to hold these posts. And so it is not an easy thing. Um, I, I mean, confidentially, um, some of, the, some of the, the things I have heard, you know, especially from men and the condescending way that it has happened over the years, not only in this current job, because in this current job, once somebody said, well, I cannot understand why Karen, Karen Kwong chose a black woman to send to us. And, you know, this, these are the kinds of things that you, you get. And so you must always try to be your best and better than your best, better than men, always. And so the fact that I am here tells me or sends a very strong message to me and to women that we have the chance and we must never be afraid with the chances that we are given. Absolutely. Here, here. And I'm, you're doing an excellent job paving the way. And Thank we you. are all very proud of you. So continue to, to do what you're doing. Um, my daughters are not here at the moment, but I'm going to replay this so that they can hear. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the, it must have been extremely difficult for you on occasion to, to have, well, for basically for your entire life to, to keep proving that women are, are just as capable. And I know many other women, not only in the Caribbean, but the world, um, you know, would take this message. Because hope what we are, we're actually broadcasting globally, so maybe some alumni in other places will, will be affected by, by what you have said as well. I'm sure they will be. Um, okay. Now I have a question from a graduate of our open campus in St. Lucia, who says, you mu you, they know you travel a lot. Is it mostly in the Caribbean? Where else have you been? that sticks out in your mind? I have traveled globally. I, um, for me, I think one of the, my best experiences was when I represented the St. Lucian government at the Commonwealth Heads of Government in Perth. At the time we were going through elections and nobody could go, none of the, none of the uh, ministers. So I was the one chosen as a special envoy to go. It was a very good experience for me because on the stage, there were three other women, the Queen, the then um, Prime Minister of Australia, and the representative from India. So, and everybody else in the Commonwealth was male. Wonderful. And so it, it was a very good experience for me, but I have traveled widely, and um, uh, I just recently came from Serbia, and Serbia was a very interesting experience you know, coming, um, uh, 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 you know, what people would consider an underdeveloped European country, but tremendous warmth, tremendous warmth, as people from developing countries have. And it, it tells me that we are not so dissimilar in the world. Absolutely. And I remember going to Japan and the peace of Japan and the calm and the quiet of Japan, the serenity, the Greek gardens and so on. Mm -hmm. So I have traveled all over and, um, but I have to tell you that for me, my best experience ever was going to South Africa. Ah. Going, to, going to Africa for me and going to Haiti within the region, my heart beats faster, beats differently. You can feel the difference. When, they, when you say that Haiti is the soul of the Caribbean, you can feel it when you land in Haiti. And the same for me when I went to the continent for the first time. And I look forward to many, many more trips like that, where you can feel a difference in your being. Wow, it's amazing. Important. Yes, absolutely. Well, now those, those two are now on my bucket list. <laughs> <laughs> I've been to Haiti, and I, I understand. I was only there for two days, but I do understand what you're saying. In that brief time, the spirit of the people, 
Nice. Just bowled me over. Amazing, amazing. Um, the same graduate is asking, she has to travel for her business and she wonders how you organize and manage and, and balance the rest of your life. <laughs> <laughs> Practical hints. <laughs> I do it very, very, in a very organized manner. I am very organized. Sometimes I have back-to-back -back trips. I have three suitcases packed. I land one night and leave the next morning. I am ready and I do not stress. Okay. Whatever I forget at home can remain at home. I am very simple when it comes to these things. I have, a, I have set things that I, I take with me and they always go with me. And so I, I really and truly do not stress about it. I am one of these people, wherever I am is where I'm supposed to be. So if I am on an airport and the flight is delayed for hours and hours, I'm very calm. The same thing when I am checking in, you know, I think that you have to be polite. You always have to be respectful to people because I always think that um, people who are dealing with so many customers at the same time must be under pressure. So I take the opportunity to show respect. I take the opportunity to not give trouble. You know, no matter who I am and what position I am in, I am never going to tell you, don't you know who I am? I am, that's my work, that's not who I am. And so I take it in stride. I will not always be a secretary general. I will not always be an ambassador. I believe that you have to be ordinary in whatever you do. You do exceptional things in your work, but as a person, you take it in stride. Wonderful advice. And I hope, hopefully she will get as organized as you will, <laughs> you are. <laughs> And I, the, the part about whatever is not is left at home is very key, definitely, for all of us who travel. Just don't stress and, and make, make, make it happen. Um, I do have another question from a graduate from our open campus, St. Kitts and Nevis. Um, they asked, as you travel, to what extent do you try to inform and educate persons about St. Lucia and the Caribbean? Thank you very much for that question from the open campus. I am also the chair of the council of the open campus. First female also to do that. Absolutely. And I take every opportunity to, to educate, even as secretary general, no matter where I go, and you can see some of, the, some of that on, on, on the internet, I take the opportunity to speak to young people about the Caribbean, about my work, about St. Lucia, but I, I, I try, because I'm such a regionalist, not to focus only on St. Lucia. I try to give a perspective on our region, and that is very important to me. And even when I went to Serbia, I spoke to the Serbian diplomatic school on the Caribbean and what it has to offer. So I take the opportunity, this is one of the things that my staff know, wherever I go to in the world, I also want an engagement of young people so I can speak to them on the Caribbean. I think that lecturing was the, my best job. And so I take that opportunity to, to continue to do that. Excellent. Um, I, now you mentioned your other new connection, which is the being chair of our Open Campus Council. And in this role, you're also charged to formally guide the strategic financial and, and administrative affairs of the Open Campus within the university's new strategic direction. Um, how have you found it so far? I told them after my first meeting it was my easiest job, but it is also a very important job for me because of the fact that I think that the open campus has an opportunity to not just remain in the Caribbean, not keep you in the Caribbean only, but to help you get that global strategic face. And I think that much more can be done we have done an excellent job for the last 10 years. Remember, we are celebrating our 10th anniversary. And I think the next 20 years will really um, mark us as the, the place in the world where we especially reach out to our diaspora. I was in Nicaragua a, a few months ago. And in Nicaragua, there's a place called Blue Fields. It will be, the name will be familiar for you. Yes, absolutely. There's also a place in Jamaica called Blue Fields. That's right. And the people in Bluefields, Nicaragua, speak English because they are Caribbean people. And they are so looking forward to engaging with Caribbean people, especially at the level of the university. 
So I look forward to us meeting all pockets of Caribbean people, whether it's in Panama or Colombia or Nicaragua, as I said, throughout the region. We are everywhere and we have made a contribution everywhere and we need to share that through the university. Absolutely. The Open Campus really does serve the tertiary needs of, of the Caribbean nationals, as you said, and has the global aspect. Uh, because I be do believe, and, and the university has recognized, that that is where, that is the direction the world is taking in terms of education and giving more access. So you are really leading the charge at the forefront, and we are very pleased that you're at the helm of the Open Campus. So thanks again for that. Um, what was it like when you were first appointed as ambassador for your country and had to present your credentials and you know the, the kind of first experience? How, how was that? It was interesting for me because you, you realize in most of my jobs, I didn't operate at the level of an, it's very different being an ambassador than being a university lecturer or even being at the central bank where we had that kind of, access but what i realized as ambassador is that you got more access mm -hmm. especially people um, who, who create design policy got a chance to listen to you mm -hmm. and for me that was very important i was ambassador to caricom and oasis and i was also responsible for diaspora affairs so i was responsible at one level the caricom level which is a bigger level then uh, the, the OECS, where we were trying to put in place um, the OECS Economic Union, that was so important because we had to strengthen the center of CARICOM. And then I was also responsible for diaspora solutions all over the world. And I got an opportunity and had a very extensive network globally. We Caribbean people are everywhere. And so I got that opportunity to speak to them and to bring home to them. So being an ambassador was very important to me. I still see myself in many ways an ambassador for the region, even if it's a greater region. I am the CARICOM representative here at the ACS. And so I try to promote um, Caribbean things and to, to, to speak about our Caribbeanness. Latin America has a Caribbean coast that is just starting to embrace. And so I think it's my duty as an ambassador from Caribbean, first of all, to ensure that people understand our region, they respect our region, and they work with us. That is what it's about, partnerships to ensure that we develop. Absolutely, wonderful. Um, so, uh your role now as Secretary General um, of the Association of Caribbean States. There are several regional organizations. Um, do you find it difficult to have the ACS distinguish itself from others? And what mandates do you seek to fulfill in that respect? ACS does not have, a, have difficulty distinguishing itself. It's a very focused organization. All of our work is centered around protection of the Caribbean Sea, as is noted in our convention. So everything that we do, sustainable tourism, trade, transport, economic external relations, and Caribbean Sea and disaster risk reduction, all of them are designed to ensure sustainable development of the region. And so we are the only organization, for example, recognized for doing these things. And so we, we, we have very narrow mandates, and so we are very focused. We are not as broad as any of the other regional organizations. Apart from that, we are not a political organization. We are an intergovernmental cooperation organization. So we have a very eclectic membership. We have 25 independent um, member states from around the perimeter of the Caribbean Sea. We have 10 associate members. We have the smallest independent country, which is St. Kitts and Nevis, and we have the biggest one, which is Mexico. So we have giants and we have bigger giants in the region. And so um, that diversity that we, we have makes for a very strong, a strong cooperation organization. We have a very interesting mix also, and we are the only regional organization that have that mix. 
where we have observer members and observer organizations. So we have 28 observer members from throughout the world. The only continent we do not have within our organization is Australia. Okay. And so we, um, we also work very closely in partnership with our observer members. To a great extent, they are the ones who help us with projects. Quite apart from our members, we have some very um, strong members like Mexico, um, Colombia, Venezuela, that help us with our projects. Cuba, technical support um, unsurpassed. So we have a number of external and internal um, countries with which we cooperate. We are not a political organization. And because of that, views contend and consensus is reached at this organization. Excellent. It's, uh, probably more people should follow, more organizations should follow that example of taking out the politics. It might make the world run smoother. <laughs> Well, we do deal with some, part, some areas that are very political. For example, in protection of the Caribbean Sea, our, our heads of government always make the political claim that we, um, we do not like nuclear waste passing through the Caribbean Sea. So it is our, it's our biggest political statement. We have another political statement about non-interference in the internal affairs of our member states. So our heads do make political statements and we are guided by that. And so we do not make political statements um, with regard to these things. And we ensure that we follow these guidelines and um, especially at the level of the UN. And we, we work within the parameters that we are given. Wonderful, excellent. Um, a graduate from the Bahamas is asking, is the ACS involved in trying to resolve issues regarding intra-regional transportation in any way? And how is yes, it going? We yes, we are, and it's very difficult. Our membership has been working with regard to um, edge air links between the Caribbean and Latin America. So you will see, um, for example, COPA in the region, we we'll see Avianca in the region, but it remains difficult because to a large extent, governments do not control transport in the region. So what we really do at the ACS is, tr is transport and trade facilitation. So we help, for example, with ensuring capacity building of port workers so they understand what is happening there. We also help at the level of technology. So for example, we have a platform that we have created with the help of our partners where you can, where the governments can go in and look at, I think we have mapped 64 ports. They can go in and look at the ships, cargo ships, passenger ships, et cetera, that go in and out. And the last phase is to put in the schedules. So we are completing that project. So we do that also. Um, with regard to um, disaster risk reduction, which is also important with regard to transport, because last year during these serious hurricanes, you would not believe the challenges we faced with regard to transport in the region. Yes, I know, it was terrible. So, so we try to also work at, at that level. As I said, it's not an easy thing, and because we are not the ones who, um, who are involved in transport, it is not governments to perceive. Yes, one or two governments have airlines, but that's not the only reason why we have challenges. And um, we are hoping that we can engage more with the uh, people who own airlines and the governments who own airlines to be able to talk about this because transportation makes everything more difficult in the region. We cannot meet each other because to move from Trinidad to St. Lucia is more expensive than to move from, from Trinidad to, to New York. So we have to look at all of these things. Our people cannot meet. Earlier we spoke about the fact that our people must meet and exchange. We don't meet enough for us to understand each other enough and transportation is very important to that. With regard to the Bahamas, very difficult to get to the Bahamas except through Miami. I would like the Bahamas to, to take a more active role 
in the ACS. It's one of our members that we need to engage with more. You can imagine for a secretary general of 25 member states, 10 associate member states, it's not an easy task to go to all of my membership. And so I would like to engage with them more and I look forward to, to going to meet with the government in the Bahamas. Wonderful. A graduate from the Mona campus is asking, what, what are the responsibilities of each Caribbean citizen in your opinion? He says, no Caribbean government can do it alone. All citizens must play a role. And this must be taught in schools along with civics, etc. We're all responsible for our future. He's asking for your comments. I couldn't agree with, with him more. We have removed from a lot of our schools, both history, social studies and, and civics. So we learn about the rest of the world and we don't learn about ourselves. I think that it is important for us to put these things back at the heart of our, uh, our curriculum. I think that we, um, we need to create opportunities for young people to travel throughout the region. I have um, internships, for example, but uh, sometimes nobody, you know, would accept the internships. We will have partners, for example, like the, the CRIF that has um, internships and people have not applied for them and the CRIF is paying for these internships um, to come to Trinidad for, for, for students to work with us for a few months, for them to understand more our region. We need to, 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 to understand that our focus must be on ourselves also. It cannot just be on the... And so I would like to see these things reintroduced into our schools. Um, I have been here for uh, WI, no school me to speak to them. I think that I have a lot to, to offer to schools. When I was in St. Lucia, I went around to the schools, but I had to impose myself on the school for it to, to, to accept. And then when I went, they would say, oh, we really must do more of this. <laughs> I think that we need to do it throughout the region. I am very happy to speak. When I come to Jamaica, I would be very happy to go to any school and speak about the Caribbean, about the region, etc. So, So I look forward to my trip to Jamaica to do that. Okay, we'll try, definitely try and arrange something while you're here. Um, I know that in 2016, you gave a public lecture on the topic, the reparations movement, a ragtag collection of racial malcontents marching to the beat of their own drum. And you are a founding member of the St. Lucia National Reparations Committee. So regarding all of that, do you believe it's important for Caribbean people to support and carry on the CARICOM quest for reparations from Britain, France, and other European states for slavery and native genocide in the Caribbean? Yes, I do. Because if we don't, we will continue to be disrespected as a region. I think that it is important for us to understand what happened to us, to not make an excuse that, um, oh, it was a long time ago, it was in the past. It is still affecting us today as individuals. We have not had that um, resolution it is still impacting us as a region. We continue to, um, to think of what we do as small. We continue to belittle ourselves without realizing our greatness. And it is because of uh, the color of our skin and how we have been treated in the past that it will continue in the future. You can see it globally now. You can see what is happening in the world now we as Caribbean people will not get the respect because of the color of our skin. And so I think that it is important for us to ask for that respect. Many other places there have been different forms of enslavement as well as different forms of repression. Governments will come back or regions will come back and apologize. They will make amends. They will try to repair the damage. They refuse to do that in our region. I think that we need, that is one of the areas I think we need to have a strong voice. We cannot be wishy-washy about this. This is who we are as people. 
more than that, I want to res I want respect for Caribbean women. I spoke about the challenges that I face as a Caribbean woman earlier. Caribbean women were at the bottom of the social strata with in slavery, black women, and we continue to have that challenge. I want reparations for Caribbean women. I want that when you look at a black woman, you do not you, you consider her as beautiful as any other race. You know, for years we have had to, to go through that. You know, for you to for you to achieve anything, you must be a certain size, color, hair texture, and so on. No, we want reparations for all of that um, demeaning of who we are as a people. Absolutely. Strong words, and I'm sure the sentiment is, is um, echoed and felt by many across the region. In fact, while you've been speaking, I've been getting several questions and comments coming in from graduates in Tobago, Grenada, Barbados, all basically agreeing with you, and but saying, do you think, I mean, we're all asking for it, but do you believe reparations will one day be given? It's not going to be an easy thing. Nothing worth fighting for is easy. You will discover that, especially the people who are asking these questions are women. Yes. I am telling you that we will make small strides, but we must never give up. We didn't start asking for reparations um, since CARICOM set up, you know. Mm -hmm. I remember during enslavement, slaves who had freed themselves were already asking for reparations. That is, that is a long time ago. There's a gentleman in St. Lucia who, when the, when the Royal Commission came, spoke to them about reparations for Caribbean people and for St. Lucians. And that was, that was a long time ago. I remember after the Moyne Commission, we asked for reparations. We are not asking now. We must never give up the fight. Why should we give up the fight for something that is right? Yes. Let's fight for our rights. I agree. I agree. Um, I, I, I'm very pleased to those who might be just joining us that our special guest today on Pelican Talks is Ambassador Dr. June Suma. Um, and what, I have been getting questions about the other universities that you attended. Um, you lectured at the University of North Carolina in Wilmington, the University of North Carolina Central, and you were a visiting lecturer at the University of San Francisco Department of Curriculum and Instruction. I know I can get, we, I'm sure those of, of, of those viewers who have been with us from the beginning know how much you enjoy teaching and lecturing, but how, how was it in a different non-Caribbean setting? Well, let me start if, if with San Francisco. It was very um, interesting for me. One lecturer at the time, which has since passed, but her name was Anita, Anita de France. She came to Barbados um, with a group of students from her university and, and approached the university for me to do a lecture with her students. And I did that. I was very busy, it was during exam time, so I had to do the lecture on a Saturday. So I came in to, to, to work on a Saturday to do that lecture. And they were so impressed with the lecture and with Caribbean history on the whole, and the, 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 the kind of discussions that we had openly about enslavement, something that they didn't see in the United States, that they invited me to come and speak about education and, and history and, and, and these issues. So the first time I went, I had a set topic and I, I stood up in front of the class and I started to speak about history and, and how I saw it. And everybody was looking at me very blank. And I realized that I did not start at the beginning. They didn't understand where we came from. And so I just had to scrap that lecture. I said, look, and let me start from the beginning. And I put down my lecture. And I just spoke to them about Caribbean history. And they invited me a couple more times to do that. And so that was a very interesting. It happened during the summer. Even when I went to North Carolina to, to lecture, they would still invite me from North Carolina to come up and speak. Oh. Wow. And then, um, then I went to North Carolina, Wilmington, first as an exchange professor from UE um, history department. And that was very interesting. Um, my history department was a few floors, not like my small history department at Cable. 
a few floors. And, but the most interesting thing for me about that experience was that in that entire um, three and four floor building, there were three black people in the building. Another history professor, myself, and the janitor. Wow. Came to speak and I, and I spoke about, and, and my lectures were on Caribbean history. Yes. from the beginning to the you know to the 1960s so that was very interesting for me but the students really embraced it wilmington itself was a very interesting society because black people lived on the periphery of the society so when i went to places it was very strange to see a black woman in certain places stores and so on certain supermarkets and I remember going to a particular restaurant, which was, had really good food. And every time the same, I had an Egyptian friend who lectured also on, on the campus. So we would go to this restaurant. And every time we saw the waitress approaching, she would look at me and say, um, you so pretty. And so my friend would start to laugh even before she came to us. And one day she said to me a most interesting thing. She said, you so pretty, you're not quite black, are you? You're not quite and black. Black. And wow. so that, 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 that shaped, you know, my perception of, the, of, the, of Wilmington. And then I went to do history and realized that there was at one point a very prominent black middle class. They owned newspapers, banks, etc. And one day, the Ku Klux Klan came in and burnt all the businesses and forced if all the black people to the periphery of the town. And then I moved to North Carolina Central, which was a different experience for me because I lectured at the first black university in the South, Central. And so um, Durham was, I mean, everybody, including the, the, the provost, the, you know, the, the, the level of the chancellor, et cetera, were black people, Julius Chambers, who was in the Supreme Court, was the head of the university. And so it was a very different experience. But one of the things that was even more di different for me in the room was the fact that it brought to me the fact that, that Caribbean education and uh, UWE in particular, especially at the level of a first degree, is more than first class. Yes. We'd certainly agree. So, so, so it was a very, it was a, there's this kind of small town mentality. I have a wall and you can drive. The global view that I lectured a course on world history between the different histories, because although I, I, I lectured Caribbean history, at UWE I also did South African history. Um, History, European history, West Africa, Caribbean history, and so on. So I had a perspective of all of the histories that I brought together in a course which I called World History. I also lectured on women, women's history, and I did a course, very unique course, um, U.S. foreign policy in the Caribbean. So, so they were all interesting and unique experiences, and. Um, I really cherish the time that I spent outside of the Caribbean for me to really appreciate what we have at home. That's right. We, we, we really don't know what we have at home. And based on everything you said this morning, I think we're going to have to have you more than once to Jamaica because you have so much to say and so much to impart. So you. uh, you'll have to do several modules of, of your life experiences and your, and your expertise. Um, I know as well that um, ACS uh, is very concerned with uh, sustainable development and one of the concerns is of course climate change for small island developing states and I, I don't really know if um, it, it actually might be good to share with some of our viewers now some facts about how climate change is affecting our Caribbean so that more persons will pay attention. Um, I know that you presented a paper in Milan in Italy in 2015 on climate change on behalf of the Caribbean and St. Lucia. And um, probably people are, would be more alarmed, uh, especially um, those that have young children, because they, those are the persons who are going to have to, to be dealing with issues of climate change in the next five, 10 years and beyond. And just a couple of things that our, our total annual rainfall is expected to decrease by as much as 12% pretty soon. And 
Most of us in the Caribbean can see this has already started. The Bahamas is projected to, if the sea level rises to just five feet, to lose about 80% of its, of its land mass. St. Vincent and the Grenadines has already started to lose some of their beaches. You mentioned earlier um, um, our, the extreme hurricanes that we're all experiencing, the fact that some of our um, countries might have to relocate our seaports and airports even our tourist resorts and agricultural land near the sea are going to be threatened. How have you found countries reacting to climate change as Secretary General of the ACS? Not quickly enough. Mm -hmm. Not quickly enough. Because you said five years, but we are already experiencing a lot of difficulties in the region. Right. Um, let me start at the sea because that's the focus of the organization. Right. The Caribbean Sea has, is one of the areas of the most biodiversity in the world because it's almost like a lake. You see the way we frame the Caribbean Sea. And because of that, we are facing many challenges and we try to deal with them at the level of the ACS. Right now, for example, Sagasam seaweed is inundating our beaches. Yes, I see. Okay affecting one of our main economic areas, tourism. Then we have the, 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 the we already said the, the hurricanes, etc. You're talking about drought, but we are going to experience long-term drought, but we also have a, um, periods of such intense rainfall that we are also dealing with flooding. Right. So we have to also look at that. I remember being in St. Lucia one Christmas, we had just a trough that sat over the country for 24 hours and destroyed infrastructure, this destroyed our celebration of Christmas, you know, et cetera. And that was only a trough. That's I right. remember when Hurricane Thomas um, passed, some of us received in the Eastern Caribbean, we received three years worth of rainfall in 24 hours. Oh my goodness. So these are the things that we are talking about. We are talking about the, the, having the biggest, the second biggest barrier reef in the world outside of Belize. And we are having challenges because of invasive species like the lionfish, we already said so that's some seaweed. Right. So we have to talk about all of these issues together. We have to see the synergies. It is not simply about a sustainable tourism portfolio. It is not simply about a portfolio on the Caribbean Sea, but how we work together, government, businesses, um, social actors, citizens, to protect these things. Climate change is also being exacerbated by the things that we do as human beings. And so the plastic bottles that are on our sh sea shore after one of these disasters, you cannot swim in the sea. You know, the garbage that we, we, we send down our rivers. These are all things that we are supposed to talk about. But we cannot speak about it in a vacuum. Sustainable tourism is challenged by the fact that in many cases, we are small island developing states. We are poor small island developing states. We are unequal, poor small island developing states. We cannot speak about sustainable development if we do not speak about equality. We cannot do it separately because for whom are we making the country sustainable? I think that the two things, inequality and sustainable development must go hand in hand. We must have that in-depth discussion. I went to a meeting in Cuba uh, last month or a CLAC meeting where we started the conversation about inequality and sustainable development. And I made a presentation from where I sit as um, the Secretary General, but more than that, I made the presentation from where I sit as a black woman from a small developing country in our region. If we do not have a voice as small island developing states, um, and people even try to diminish the voice we have, even if we are independent countries, we are not going to make an impact. If we, have a, if we do not have a voice for more than 50% of our population, and 50% is putting it very low, 
because in some of our countries we have 40% poverty rates and we have another 20% of people living on the border of, of poverty. If we do not speak about these things, if we do not speak to the issue of the inequality that, um, that enslavement caused, caused, where our people were forced to live on marginal lands on the side of mountains or near rivers and who are now being affected by climate change. It is not because poor people want to live where they live, it's because they do not have a choice. We have to speak about sustainable development in the context of the inequality in our region. And I think that when we have that conversation, I will be much happier. Absolutely. And when you come, I would love you to meet with the Vice Chancellor's UESTAT ambassadors who have an action advocacy network um, for climate change and sustainable development as a youth group. I think it's very important that they have a voice too. So I'll also put that on your calendar if you don't mind. Your Thank you. <laughs> um, I just want to mention, we have to wrap up shortly, but just to mention that you have several publications in your name. You've mentioned Cricket, your affinity to cricket. You wrote two books that I know of, Cricket and the Politics of Integration and an Article, area of not books. <laughs> How many? Articles, not books. Oh, articles. Um, yes, by Stoddard and Beckles. Yes, that's right. Yes. Uh, and you've written um, articles too, uh, and uh, The Runaway Slave Woman in the Windward Islands and The Manipulation of the Production and Reproduction of African Women in the Caribbean During Slavery. All things that I think our viewers would probably go and look at, look out now if they haven't yet read them after hearing you. Um, You've also made several academic presentations in our region as well as globally dealing with historical, socioeconomic, and gender related issues. And you have received several awards, including Executive of the Year from St. Kitts and Nevis, uh, the Award for Outstanding Contribution to the Development of Human Resources in CARICOM Central Banks, and the UE University of North Carolina at Wilmington Exchange Faculty Award. So Everyone having listened to this will see and know that you are an extremely distinguished lady, a, a true representative of the Caribbean, of one of whom we are extremely pr proud as you are also a UE Pelican. Um, and I would just like to thank you, especially your excellency for joining us today on Pelican Talks. Uh, you are the secretary general of the ACS and the UWI Open Campus Council Chair you have made your mark in diplomatic, financial, and education sectors regionally and internationally. And I'm truly honored to have been able to speak with you today. I'd like also to thank uh, Howard Chand, our digital media and database manager who facilitates this Google Hangout. Your, your Excellency, oh, as well, Jabari Fraser, who is your assistant on your end. I don't know what we do without these young men, though I do think we, that we'd manage as, as ladies. <laughs> <laughs> um, so thank you very, very much. We look forward to you joining us uh, again in the future, and I look forward to, to seeing you again in Jamaica. And to our viewers, we hope you will also join us on our next Pelican Talks, where we engage alumni across the Caribbean and the world. So thanks for tuning in, and until next time, remember to show your Pelican pride. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, too. <laughs>